this world, think of the sway stacks. They look like they are long stalks that extend 15, 20, 30 feet into the air. Numerous ones coming up with a bulb on the end. They sway in the wind, but what's amazing is these aren't plants. These are animals with roots that pick up and slowly move across the planet's surface and anchor themselves back down, swaying in the wind with a wait for any creature that happens by. As a creature moves by, the top of them, like little frisbees, shoot off and wedge into the side of the creature, into their leg, into their carapace, into their hair, stuck for the moment. As they move on, they reach a new area, they drop off and they begin growing all over again. They're simply spreading their seeds with these tiny little disks flying through the air once they sense something moving by. On this planet, we see similar things with the plants and the weeds that grow here, but nothing to this size and extent. And the idea that we begin crossing plants that look like animals and animals that look like plants, this is a bizarre world indeed. Creatures like the sway stacks and the lollygars would enjoy an adequate amount of water on GPC 925. But what would happen on a world where there was even more water? A lot more. Specifically, a planet with no land whatsoever. A water world. Since we embarked on our intergalactic safari, we have seen the amazing life cycle of the ACOM on Arenel, the bizarre looking Pholus on AG143, and the floating lollygars of GPC 925. All of these theoretical life forms on these imaginary worlds have been created by scientists based on knowledge about the development of life on Earth. But how would these creatures have gotten their start on these strange, far-flung planets? The requirements that we know have to be there for life is based on the life that we know and the chemistry that we think leads to the origin and evolution of life is carbon chemistry in aqueous or water solution. So we need liquid water. We need carbon and we need nitrogen. And you need some sort of energy, because life, even microbes, needs food. They've got to have some sort of metabolism, so you need some source of energy. Sunlight works pretty well, but it isn't the only source of energy, even on Earth. For hundreds of years, scientists believed that sunlight was the only energy source for life. But within the past few decades, new findings showed they were wrong. Boiling water temperatures found around hydrothermal vents on the seafloor were once believed to be incompatible with life. But recently, scientists have discovered the areas around these black smokers are perfectly suitable for a flourishing underwater community. Instead of the sun, these creatures take their energy from the heat, gases, and minerals spewing from the vents. These highly tenacious life forms are known as extremophiles. The existence of extremophiles broadens our aspects of what we think organisms can do and what we know organisms can do. In other words, if you look at all of the different kinds of environments that we find here on Earth, it ranges from extremely cold to extremely hot to acid to alkaline. Just about anything you can think of and just about everywhere you find life. The fact that life is found at all on Earth is due in large part to our position in the solar system. 
We scientists used to believe that in order to get life off the ground on a planet, it has to be in the Goldilocks zone of the sun. Not too close, because water will boil. Not too far, because water will freeze. But just right to have a liquid ocean out of which DNA can form. Well, that picture we now know is wrong. We now believe that even on icy moons of planets like Jupiter, it is possible to get life off the ground. Europa is the moon of Jupiter. It's covered in ice. But beneath the ice, there is apparently a gigantic ocean, perhaps stable for billions of years, containing liquid water. And so that sent the physicists and scientists scrambling. How could you end up with liquid water so far away from the sun? Now, what it turns out the idea is, is that there's something called tidal flexing. For Europa, tidal flexing is caused by the immense size and gravitational pull of Jupiter, which causes the ice on the moon to pull and stretch, generating heat. Once the insulated lower layers get warm enough, the ice will melt, creating oceans. Now add the types of organic compounds that are believed to exist on Europa, and you've got a slightly altered but very realistic recipe for life. This brings us to our next stop in our intergalactic safari. As we leave the busy skies of GPC 925 behind, we can travel 72 light years to a theoretical gas giant known as Ynir G, a planet circled by eight moons. Normally, we wouldn't bother with Ynir G. It's a gas giant, and we don't think life could exist on these worlds. The world we're interested in is the moon Anarbas. It's about twice the size of Mercury. It's a world very similar to the moon Europa that circles around Jupiter. Imagine a planet covered with oceans, and on the surface, ice, a lot of ice that locks everything inside. There's no ground to walk on this planet. But inside these oceans, they could be teeming with life. And with the constant pull by Ynir G, Honor Boss would most likely have a large amount of geothermal activity that could be a prime source of energy for life to begin. Near the surface on Honor Boss, small amounts of light may bleed through the thinner areas of ice to the water below. Here, some creatures may have evolved eyes this may provide them with advantages, but would also make them vulnerable to certain defense techniques. One example of a cunning underwater escape artist is the Amabos. To us, light is just light. But think of the Amabos, a small little almost gelatinous looking creature that swims through the water, innocent. As anything comes close to it that threatens it, it throws out a brilliant flash of sparkling lights all around it, blinding whatever creature came up to it. And in that moment, it's gone. Much like a squid might shoot out a big ink cloud or an octopus underwater, it is suddenly masked by brilliant lights that almost look like the 4th of July. <laughs> 